be in 2 Peter chapter 1, and I've titled today's message, Be Who You're Meant to Be. Be Who You're Meant to Be. Someone once observed that a wasted life is really nothing more than a collection of wasted days. As God gives us life, each one of us starts the new year with the same number of opportunities, 365, that we can choose to either use and invest in eternal things or allow to drift by without taking advantage of the gift we've been given. For many, a new year marks a brand new unspoiled page in their book of time. A next chance at living a better life. Now, the difference between those who succeed and those who fail depends on their willingness to look back and apply what they've learned during the past 12 months. Many of you know self-reflection, and these are things I've said here in this pulpit, but self-reflection is healthy. But yes, it can also be scary. It usually results in serious changes in our lives. But as we'll soon see, Peter opened his second, when Peter opened up his second letter, he didn't have change. He didn't just have change in mind. He wanted to see people, his audience, his readers, us, transform their lives and be more like Christ. Now, the church in general, in this, and this church as well, we talk a lot about transformation being reborn and living a new life in Christ, transformation. But I think, in all reality, many still don't understand what it means to be transformed. There's a lot of people out there that have yet to fully grasp what it, what it would mean to embrace change in their entire lives as they commune with Jesus through prayer and worship. To dig into the Bible, to live the way he lived, with their lives fully uh, dictated by the wonderful agenda of God. See, church, with God, we can become more than what we could ever imagine. And that is an absolutely beautiful thing. And so in the passage we're going to be reading today, it should. It should be of immense interest to every Christian, every born-again believer, for two reasons. Because, one, it asks the important question, who do you want to be? Who do you want to be in 2024? And not just in 2024, but throughout your entire life. Asks who, be who you're meant to be. And secondly, also because it tells how we can keep from falling in this life and how we can be assured of a triumphal entry into the next. So before I begin reading our passage, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful again that you've given us another year to to be here, to sit in these chairs, to hear your word being read. Pray that you will 
bless this upcoming year, Lord, and that you will use us as a church and use each and every person here to be a salt and light wherever they may be, Lord. So now I pray that you will minister to us, speak to us powerfully, Lord. Change hearts, lives, perspectives, Lord. Show us the things that we need to, to know about. May we hear things, the things that you want us to hear, Lord. And not be distracted by anything that's outside these walls. Keep us safe here, Lord, and pray that you will, again, that you will work powerfully here in this room. That you work powerfully also among those that are watching this live or watching it later on or hearing it later on, Lord. You know that's what your word does. Changes lives, transforms. So yes, Lord. Bless this time and look forward to what you have to say. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Second Peter. So I'm going to read the entire passage, verses 3 to 11, and then I'm going to, I'm going to break this down uh, into three parts. So I'll share with you now what the Word of God is says Second Peter chapter 1 verse 3 His divine power has given us everything, everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. By these He has given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing from his past sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election, because if you do these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, entry into the for in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly provided for you. As many of you know, and as Peter alluded to in his introduction, the Christian life begins with saving faith. Faith in the person of Jesus Christ. But here's the thing. When you know Jesus Christ personally, you also experience God's power. And this power produces life and godliness. Ephesians chapter 2 and John chapter 5 tell us that the unsaved sinner is dead. And only Christ can raise that person from the dead. Remember back when in John chapter 11 when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead? What did he tell him? He said, loose him and let him go. Friends, if 
you haven't done so already. This new year, now that it's begun, get rid of the grave clothes. Get rid of the grave clothes and be who you're meant to be. When you are born into the family of God by faith in Christ, you are born complete. God gives you everything you need for life and godliness. Nothing, nothing at all has to be added. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10, you are complete in Him. As a born-again Christian, as a born-again believer, today, right now, you are complete in Him. There's a lot of false teachers out there in Jesus' day that claim that they had a special doctrine that would add something to the lives of Peter's readers. Peter knew. Peter knew that nothing at all could be added. You see, just as a normal baby is born with all the equipment that he or she needs for life, they only need to grow. So the Christian, similarly, the Christian has all that they need and only needs to grow. God never has to call back any of his models because something is lacking or faulty. No. Perfect. You have everything that you need. He's giving you everything that you need. Just as a baby has a definite genetic structure that determines how he or she will grow up, so the believer is genetically structured to experience glory and goodness. Some of your Bibles may say virtue, virtue, glory and virtue. I may use those two words interchangeably. Essentially mean the same thing, goodness and virtue. Here's the thing, one day, that person that is genetically structured to experience glory and goodness One day, he, she will be like the Lord Jesus Christ. See, my friends, we've been called to his eternal glory. That's what it says in uh, 1 Peter 5, verse 10. And we shall share that glory when Jesus Christ returns returns and takes his people to heaven. But we're also called to goodness. We have been saved so so we might, so that you might proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. My friends, church, born-again believer, my brothers and sisters in Christ, you shouldn't have to wait to get to heaven to become like Jesus Christ. Each and every one of you today, right now, are becoming more like Christ. Now, we will never, while we're living in these bodies, in these sinful bodies, in, in, in this mortal flesh, We will still sin, we're not perfect like Christ, but every day, the more we draw near to Christ, we draw near to God, become more and more like Him. You don't have to wait to get to heaven to be like Jesus Christ. In our character and conduct, we should reveal, reveal His beauty and grace. Not tomorrow, not yesterday, today. 
feel His beauty and grace today. God hasn't only given us what we need for life and godliness, but verse 4 tells us He has also given us His Word to enable us to develop this life and godliness. The promises are great. They're great because they come from a great God and they lead to a great life. They are precious because their value is beyond calculation. If we lost the Word of God right now, there would be no way to replace it. Now, Peter, he must have really liked the word precious, for he wrote about precious faith in 2 Peter in, in verse 1. 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 1. He wrote about it in verse 7. The precious, he wrote about precious promise in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, the precious blood in chapter 1, verse 19. The precious stone in chapter 2, verses 4 and 6. And the precious Savior in chapter 2, verse 7. So he definitely liked that word precious. When a sinner believes in Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to impart the life and nature of God within. And just like the, a baby shares the nature of, his parent, of its parents, a person born of God shares the divine nature of God. The lost sinner, the unregenerate person, the person who was not born again, is decaying because of his corrupt nature. But the Christian can experience a dynamic, dynamic life of godliness because he has God's divine nature within. Romans chapter 8 verse 21 says that mankind is under the bondage of corruption, but the believer shares the freedom and growth that is a part of possessing a divine nature. Let me put it another way. Let me give you some other illustrations. Nature determines appetite. The pig wants slop, right? Pig food. And according to the 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, a dog will even re eat its own vomit. Yes, it says that. It says that. A dog will eat its own vomit. But the sheep desires green pastures. Nature also determines behavior. An eagle flies because it has an eagle's nature. And a dolphin swims because that's the nature of the dolphin. Nature determines environment. Squirrels climb trees. Moles burrow underground. And a trout swims in the water. Nature also determines association. Lions travel in prides, sheep in flocks, and fish in schools. So, if nature determines appetite, and we have God's nature within, then we ought to have an appetite for that which is pure and holy. That's what you ought to hunger for. That's what you ought to really seek 
this upcoming year. Our behavior ought to be like that of the Father, and we ought to live in a kind of spiritual environment that is suited, that is suited to our nature. We ought to associate, associate with that which is true to our nature, the only normal fruit-bearing life for the child of God is, is a godly life. So you see, because we possess this divine nature, we have completely escaped the defilement and the decay of the present evil world. If we feed, if you feed the new nature, nourishment of the world, of the word, then we will have little interest in the garbage of the world. It just won't seem appetizing. The more you feed yourself with the spiritual things, with the things of God, with His Word, with prayer, seeking communion with Him, those things of the world just aren't going to taste any good. But here's the thing. If we make provision, provisions for the flesh, our sinful nature will lust after the old sins and we will disobey God. And so godly living is the result of cultivating the new nature within. In order to be who you're meant to be, you have to cultivate that nature within. Now, that was verses 3 and 4. Now, let me break down verses 5 through 7. Where there is life, there must be growth. The new birth is not the end. It's the beginning. God gives all of you, all of his children, all they need to live godly lives. But his children must apply themselves and be diligent to use the means of grace he has provided. You see, spiritual growth isn't automatic. It doesn't just happen. It requires cooperation with God and the application of spiritual diligence and discipline. As Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13 says, Work out your own salvation, for it is God which worketh in you. Now from there, Peter lists seven characteristics of the godly life. But we mustn't think of them as seven beads on a string or seven stages of development. That's not what they are. These are, again, characteristics of a godly life. And these are things that maybe, characteristics that maybe you can work on this upcoming year. That word there, supplement. First of all, means to supply generously. In other words, we develop one quality as we exercise another quality. These graces relate to each other the way the branch relates to the trunk and the twigs to the branch. Like the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, these qualities grow out of a life and out of a vital relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, it's not enough for the Christian to let go and let God. I'm sure you've heard of that before. It's not enough. 
people say that as though spiritual growth were God's work alone. It's not. Literally, Peter wrote, make every effort to bring alongside the father and the child must work together. Now, the first quality of character Peter listed was goodness. We saw this word back in verse 3, and it basically means excellence. To Greek philosophers, it meant the fulfillment of a thing. When anything in nature fulfills its purpose, that is virtue, moral excellence. The word is also used to describe the power of the gods to do heroic things. The land that produces crops is excellent because it's fulfilling its purpose. The tool that works correctly is excellent because it's doing what the tool is supposed to do. A Christian is supposed to glorify God because he has God's nature within. So when he does this, when a believer does this, he or she shows excellence because they are fulfilling their purpose in life. When you glorify God, it's excellent because you're fulfilling your purpose. True virtue in the Christian life is not polishing human qualities, no matter how fine they may be, but producing divine qualities that make the person more like Jesus Christ. Faith helps us to develop virtue, and virtue helps us to develop, helps us develop knowledge. The word translated knowledge there in verses 2 and 3, means full knowledge or knowledge that is growing. The word used here suggests practical knowledge or discernment. It refers to the ability to handle life successfully. It's the opposite of being so heavenly minded as to be of no earthly good. This kind of knowledge doesn't come, doesn't come automatically. It comes from obedience to the will of God. In the Christian life, in the Christian life, my brothers and sisters, you must not separate the heart and mind, character and knowledge. Self-control is the next quality on Peter's list, list of spiritual virtues. It says in Proverbs 16.32, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. It's from a New King James, or a King James Version. Also in Proverbs 25.28, he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Paul, the Apostle Paul in his letters often compared the Christian to an athlete who must exercise and discipline himself if he ever hopes to win the prize. Endurance. Endurance is the ability to endure when circumstances are difficult, when circumstances are hard. How many of you are facing hard times right now, today, just as the new year has started? There's probably many of you. 
Endurance is the ability to endure when circumstances are difficult. Self-control has to do with, with handling the pleasures of life, while endurance relates primarily to the pressures and problems of life. Often the person who gives in to pleasures isn't disciplined enough to handle pressures either. So he or she gives up. Endurance isn't something that, again, this here isn't something that develops automatically. We must work at it. James chapter 1 verses 2 to 8 gives us the right approach. We must, you must expect trials to come. You must expect it to come because without trials, you can never learn patience. Without trials, you can never learn patience. We must live, we must, by faith, let our trials work for us and not against us. Because we know that God is, our, is at work in our trials. He's trying to teach you something. He's trying to show you something. So easy to be in a beginning or a, be, start a trial. A trial is starting out and it's so easy to say, God, why is this happening to me? Lord, this sucks. This is horrible. I can't handle this. Why? Why me, Lord? Why not that person over there? So let angels suffer, not me. <laughs> so easy. Again, to, to have those kind of thoughts, but have you ever flipped it around and say, Lord, what are you what do you want me to learn from this? What are you trying to show me? Obviously, this, is, this doesn't feel good, but it's for my own good. And a lot of times, many times, it's to draw you nearer to Him to make you more dependent on Him, to show you that you can't on your own, that you need Him. Do you need Him? I know I do. Every single day, trials will come. But your perspective, how you look at them, says a lot about really what's going on in your heart. If you need wisdom in making decision, decisions, God will grant that wisdom if you ask Him. Friends, nobody, nobody enjoys trials. But we do enjoy the confidence we can have in trials that God is at work, causing everything to work together for our good and His glory. Godliness, godliness, simply means godlikeness. In the original Greek, this word meant to worship well. It describes a man who was right in his relationship with God, who, who was right in his relationship with God and with his fellow Man, with his fellow human beings, with his fellow people. Perhaps the words reverence and piety come closer to defining the term. It's that quality of character that makes a person distinctive. He lives, he or she lives above the petty things of life, the passions and pressures that control the lives of others. 
again, he or she seeks to do the will of God. And as they do, they seek the welfare of others. We must never get into the idea that godliness is an impractical thing because it's intensely practical. The godly person makes the kinds of decisions that are right and noble. A person who lives like that doesn't take, the, doesn't take an easy path simply to avoid either pain or trial. Someone who is godly does what is right because it is right and because it's the will of God. Brotherly kindness. Brotherly affection, our passage says here, is a virtue that Peter must have acquired the hard way. For the disciples of our Lord, they, they were often debating and disagreed with one another. If we love Jesus Christ, we must also love the brethren. We should practice an un we should practice a sincere love of the brethren. And not just pretend that we love them. It says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1, let brotherly love continue. Let's go on and on and not end. Romans 12, Romans 12, 10, be kindly affectionate. Be kindly affection to one another with brotherly love. The fact that we love our brothers and sisters in Christ is one evidence that we have been born of God. How do you feel about that person that gets on your nerves at church or at another church and you know they're a born-again believer? They just... You just rather walk the opposite direction. Can keep in mind that we're told here, characteristic is to have that brotherly affection, that sisterly affection, sisterly affection, even for that person. And yes, you know, I understand we're, we're a family, and sometimes families, brothers and sisters, don't get along. But again, this is where you have to check your own heart and see, how do I feel about that person? They're my brother and sister in Christ. And one day, we're going to be up in heaven together, praising God together. And the last thing I want is to give that person the side eye. I don't think that will happen up in heaven, but, you know, or be looking and thinking, how did that person get here? Oh, again, if you have a problem, if you have beef, if you got issues, work it out with that person. If you can't, ask God for forgiveness to heal your heart. Again, having that affection is one evidence that you have been born of God. But there's more to the Christian growth and brotherly love. We must also have the sacrificial love that our Lord displayed when he went to the cross. The kind of love, charity spoken of there in verse 7. Affection with love. kind of love, again spoken of there in that verse, is agape love. The kind of love 
that God show, shows towards lost sinners. The kind of love that God showed you when you were at your worst. When you were shaking your fist up at God and saying, I don't need you. I can do it on my own. That's the same kind of love, that agape love, that, cher that love that, that we ought to be showing others. This is the love that is described in that famous chapter in 1 Corinthians, chapter 13. The love, the, the, love of the, the love that the Holy Spirit produces in our heart as we walk in the Spirit. When we have brotherly love, we love because of our likeness. We love because of our likenesses. To others. But with agape love, we love in spite of the differences we have. It's impossible for the fallen human nature to manufacture these seven qualities of Christian character. They must be produced by the Spirit of God. To be sure, there are unsaved people who possess amazing self-control and endurance. But these virtues point to them and not to the Lord. They get the glory when God produces the beautiful nature of His Son, of His Son in the Christian. It is God who receives the glory. Because we have the divine nature, <coughs> we can grow spiritually and develop this kind of Christian character. It's through the power of God and the precious promises of God that make that, that this growth takes place. A divine genetic structure is already there. God wants us to be conformed into the image of His Son. The life within will reproduce that image if we diligently cooperate with God and use the means He's lavishly given us. And, he, and here's... The amazing thing. Here's the amazing thing. As the image of Christ is reproduced in us, the process does not destroy our own personalities. We still remain uniquely ourselves. And one of the dangers in the church today is imitation. People have a tendency to become like their pastor or their youth leader or maybe someone they, one of the evangelists that, you know, people often look up to, Billy Graham or Greg Laurie or <laughs> but as they do this, they destroy their own uniqueness while failing to become like Jesus Christ. They lose both ways. Just as each child in a family resembles their parents, and yet, is, and yet different, so each child in God's family comes more and more to resemble Jesus Christ. And yet it's different. Parents don't duplicate themselves. They reproduce themselves. And wise parents permit their children to be themselves. The last section I want to cover. Verses 8 through 11. 
How can a believer be certain that he is growing spiritually? Peter gave three evidence of true spiritual growth. Fruitfulness. That's how you know you're growing spiritually. Spiritually. Christian character is an end in itself. But it's also a means to an end. The more we become like Jesus Christ, the more the Spirit can use us in witness and service. The believer who isn't growing is idle, is barren and unfruitful. His knowledge of Jesus Christ is producing nothing practical in his life or her life. The word translated idle there, or in some of your Bibles, idle, uh, it says idle. Mine says being useless. But it means ineffective. The people who fail to grow usually fail in everything else. Some of the most effective Christians that are out there are people without dramatic talents and special abilities or even exciting personalities. Yet God has used them in a marvelous and wonderful and powerful way. Why? Because they're becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. They have the character and conduct that God can trust with blessing. They are fruitful because they are faithful. They're effective because they are growing in their Christian experience. These beautiful qualities of character do exist within us because we possess the divine nature. We must cultivate them so that they increase and produce fruit in and through our lives. The next one. And evidence of spiritual growth is vision. Nutritionists tell us that diet can certainly affect vision, and this is especially true in the Christian realm. The unsaved person is in a dark because Satan has blinded his mind. A person has to be born again before his eyes are opened and he can see the kingdom of God. There's no way around it. In order to see the kingdom of God, your eyes have to be spiritually open. And if you're unsaved, if you're not born again, there's no way at all you'll be able to see it. But after those eyes are opened, it's important that we increase our vision and see all that God wants us to see. The phrase, cannot see afar, uh, cannot see or, uh, off, is translated short-sighted. It means short-sighted. It's a picture of somebody closing or squinting their eyes, unable to see at a distance. There are some Christians that could only see their own church or their own denomination who fail to see the greatness of the family around the world, of God's family around the world. Some believers see the needs at home, but have no vision for a lost world. Someone asked Philip Brooks what he would do to revive a dead church, and he replied, I would preach a missionary sermon and take up a collection. Jesus admonished his disciples, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for there are white already to harvest. Some congregations today are like the church of Laodicea. Pastor Isaac taught on this several weeks ago. They are proud that they are rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing, do not realize that they are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Friends, it's a tragedy 
to be spiritually nearsighted. But it's even great, it's an even greater tragedy to be blind. If we forget what Christ, if we forget what God has done for us, we will not be excited to share Christ with others. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, we have been purged and forgiven. God, do you see how great that God has opened our eyes? He has opened your eyes, and if he hasn't opened them yet, he can and he will. We can't forget what he's done. Let's cultivate gratitude in our hearts and sharpen our spiritual vision. Life is too short and the needs of the world too great for God's people to be walking around with their eyes closed. And then the other one, the third one, security. If you walk around with your eyes closed, you will stumble. But the growing Christian walks with confidence because he knows he's secure in Christ. It's not our profession of faith that guarantees that we're saved. It's our pro progression in the faith that gives us that assurance. Listen carefully. The person who claims to be a child of God, the person who claims to be a Christian, a born-again believer, but whose character and conduct give no evidence of spiritual growth is deceiving themselves and heading for judgment. Peter pointed out that calling and election go together. The same God who elects his people also ordains the means to call them. The two must go together. As Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation, whereunto he called you by our gospel. We do not preach election to unsaved people. We preach the gospel. But God uses the gospel to call sinners to repentance. And those sinners discover they were chosen by God. Peter also pointed out election is no excuse for spiritual immaturity or for lack of effort in the Christian life. Maybe you've heard this before by some believers, but some will say, what's it going to be? What is going to be is going to be. There's nothing we can do. It is what it is. But Peter admonished us to be diligent. This means make every effort. While it is true that God must work in us before we can do his will. It's also true that we must never be willing. We must never, we must be willing for God to work. We must cooperate with him. Divine election must never be an excuse for human laziness. A Christian who is sure of his election and calling will never stumble, but will prove by a consistent life that he truly is a child of God. Yes, we will stumble. Yes, you're going to fall. You're going to mess up. But is your life still being consistent? Is, are you still living a consistent life? What matters? It's important. The Christian will always be on the mountaintop. But here's the thing. You will always be climbing higher. If we do these things, the things listed in, there in verses 5 through 7 and 8, if you do those things, you display Christian growth and character in your daily life. Then then you can be sure you are converted 
And one day, you will be in heaven. In fact, a growing Christian can look forward to his abundant entrance into the eternal kingdom. The Greeks use this phrase to, to describe the welcome given, uh, given to Olympic winners when they returned home. Every believer, every Christian, every person that's surrendered their life to Jesus will arrive in heaven. But some, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15, will have a more glorious welcome than others. Some believers shall be saved, yet so as by fire. The word ministered there in verse 11 is the same as the word in verse 5 and is the translation of a Greek word that means to bear the expenses of a chorus. When the Greek theatrical groups presented their dramas, somebody had to underwrite the expenses, which at times could be very great, can be very costly. The word came to mean to make a lavish provision. And so if we make a lavish provision to grow spiritually, as verse 5 says, then God will make lavish provision for us when we enter heaven. Just think about it. Think about it for, for a moment. Think of the blessings that the growing Christian enjoys. If you are growing, if you are maturing as a believer, Blessings, fruitfulness, vision, security, and heaven's best. All this and heaven too. My friends, this new year has begun. Who will you be? Are you going to be who you're meant to be? Or are you going to continue to live a life still hidden among your friends and family? You don't want them to know who you really are. I'll tell you this again. When you are proud of who you are, you want to let the whole world know What kinds of, you know, every, almost every major city has these pride parades and, you know, going on in their, in their main streets. And sometimes envy that. I wish more Christians would do that, would be open with their love for Christ, with their love for Jesus, to, to exp tell people, this is who I am. Are you, do you feel that way? Think about, think about everything that Christ did for you and how he saved you. Man, you should want to tell everybody about it. You should want to scream it from the rooftops. Jesus isn't done with you. And he's going to continue to do a work in your life. And you're not done either. You're becoming more and more like Jesus. But you've got to know the person in order to be more like the person. This upcoming year, friends, be who you're meant to be. Don't hide from it. Don't run from it. Be proud that you're a child of God. And if that's not who you are this morning, and 
You want to be spiritually reborn. You want to know God more personally and you want to have these things that Christ is offering. Everlasting life, joy, peace that surpasses all understanding, strength through trials, then you can have it. You must surrender your heart to Jesus. You must understand your need for a Savior. If you think that you don't need a Savior, that you're fine, you know what? You're still a long ways away. But if you're broken, you're at your wit's end and you're tired, you've tried everything and now you want to start this new year off right, as a born-again believer, I want to invite you to the cross so that you can ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. If that's what you'd like and that's what you want to do, wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. Start the new year off right. Again, don't do this because I'm pressuring. or No, do this because you know God is calling you now to do this. you've never prayed, he leads you in a prayer to receive Jesus. So with all your heart, with all sincerity, pray this. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask you now to forgive me of my sins. Yes, I believe now that you died for my sins and that three days later you rose from the dead. I turn from my sins, I repent from them, and I confess you and you alone as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving, for forgiving me. And thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me Fill me with that divine nature. Fill me with the Holy Spirit so that He can help guide me in my new born again life so I can see the world through the eyes of Jesus. So let me understand God's will for my life. Thank you again for all you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Those watching and listening, if you pray that, please reach out to us. We want to help you in your next steps, whatever that may be. Um, but again, have a great week. Uh, be safe. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.